a couple of parables uh, this morning. First of all, from Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. Listen while I sing you this song, a song of my friend at his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil and cleared it of stones. He planted the finest vines. He built a tower to guard them and dug a pit for treading the grapes. He waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. So now my friend says, you people who live in Jerusalem and Judah, judge between my vineyard and me. Is there anything I have failed to do for it? Then why did it produce sour grapes and not the good grapes I expected? This is what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge round it, break down the wall that protects it, and let wild animals eat it and trample it down. I will let it be overgrown with weeds. I will not prune the vines or hoe the ground. Instead, I will let briars and thorns cover it. And I will even forbid the clouds to let rain fall on it. And then from uh, Luke, Luke 13, Jesus says this. About... um, Luke 13, 6. <clears throat> then Jesus told them this parable. There was once a man who had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. He went looking for figs on it, but found none. So he said to his gardener, Look, for three years I have been coming here to look for figs on this fig tree, and I have not found any. Cut it down. Why should it go on using up the soil? But the gardener answered, Leave it alone, sir, just one more year. I will dig round it and put in some manure. Then if the tree bears figs next year, so much the better. If not, then you can have it cut down. Everything I want to say this morning is conventional and what you'd expect at harvest. Um... But personally, I tend to say most the same, much the same things every harvest. And when I've come to the next harvest, I've got to ask myself, did I listen to what I said last harvest? Um, and so sometimes easy, straightforward things are the most challenging. It doesn't need lots of complex in exegesis about the passage or something you've never noticed before. And I would just challenge you with this in terms of what God says as he looks to us and says, so how... How fruitful have you been in your life? Now, some of you have got gardens and you've had a good year and some of you have not had a good year. Some of you grow vegetables and it, some vegetables have gone well. How have your potatoes gone? How are the marrows this year? How are the courgettes? We've done well for courgettes this year. How many things can you do with a courgette? <laughs> many things. But thank you, Lord, for courgettes. And, and you know what I mean? Say, and certainly with the flowers, that's part of it, isn't it? And... Um, uh, you could say, well, what, has it been a good year? Hmm? And the Lord says to us, so, okay, blow the allotment, blow the farm, blow the garden, that's good. What is your personal fruitfulness been? You know, we know that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. And as we go through that, I'm thinking, let's talk about marrows. <laughs> you know, it's more sort of cryptic, isn't it? But what, how fruitful have we been? I... I I think that's a really interesting thing. How fruitful have you been in sharing the good news with other people? How fruitful have you been with loving people, forgiving them? How fruitful have you been in your performance as a disciple, in following uh, Jesus' guidance and and receiving his power and doing new things? How, How fruitful as a church have we been? How many new Christians have we managed to make or bring to Christ if you like in this past year 52 weeks of a hundred of us working hard at it how fruitful have I been all those sermons Alastair you know how fruitful has it been come on 
want to encourage you this morning because in some ways this, this great parable from Isaiah is incredibly encouraging. Because it's about fruitfulness and it's the way God looks at us and the way it's encouraging us. And above all, the way that God invests in us. The way that God invests in us. And obviously we've got a parable here about a vineyard. And we are the vines and the church is the vineyard and it belongs to the Lord. It says he had a vineyard. And that's, that perhaps is the biggest encouragement of a lot. That if I am a vine, if I'm trying to grow as a person and as a disciple, I am part of the Lord's vineyard. He's not just put me out to see how I will do. It's amazing what people will do to belong to things. They may be interested in a certain subject or a certain thing, but actually, very often that the big things, whether they are in a choir or a band or whether they're in a craft group or a conservation group or a whatever it is, one of the big things is to belong, to meet people, to be part of something. And if you think, I, I, I'm not just called to be a disciple of Jesus, but I am part of his vineyard, I belong to him. And whatever other efforts you make in life to belong to something, be assured this morning that you belong. You belong. Sometimes in your Christian life you will feel isolated, I only I am left sort of thing. But you belong to him. He has his eye on you. And as a church, we are his vineyard. It's not our vineyard. And the upside of that is that he has ultimate responsibility. He plants us. He does all his investment in us. But we've got to bear in mind that we'll have to do this on Saturday with this conference. It is not our church. Methodism often loses this sense of belonging to God. It belo we don't belong to Methodism. We don't belong to the Methodist conference. We belong to God. It's his. You all belong. Be I like that. And I'm a loner, but I think to belong. This week, you belong to Jesus. What a great thing. Oh, that's a great. I want to be fruitful immediately when it comes to that. I'm following Jesus. I want to belong. So that's a great con. And then he invests into you. And I want you to be encouraged by him investing into you. This whole parable is about effort that he makes for you and for us. The parable doesn't start by saying, okay then, what have we done? You know, it's what has he done? And that is tremendous. He's got this thing. If we just look at, feel, feel through it, meditate it a bit on it, really. He takes out all the stones. Now, those of you who've been in the Middle East, I've lived in the Middle East, the Middle East is mostly stones. <laughs> it's not like our place where there's the odd stone. It's mostly stone with the odd bit of earth, you know? And, and, and to, to, you know, really stoning is a, is a big job. And it's a hard job, it's a hot job, it's a middle job. But as we know from other parables, when you've got stone, you don't get any growth. And I just think this is a good picture of, of what Jesus has done for us on the cross to forgive us for our sins. Because it's not going to grow with all that stuff in the way. And so the rocks and the stones need to go. You will not be able to forgive yourselves. You will not be able to become fruitful. And if you try and do that, what will be happening is what I do in my allotment sometime with a big stone, I move it round. I don't want it there, so I'll move it over and plonk it somewhere else. All those of you, all those of you here will have got perennial sins that you're avoiding and moving around, but they're always gonna, you're going to fall over them somewhere else, aren't you? Forgiveness, I will remember them no more. I will remove them. I will remove them, even if they are big rocks. What an effort that is. And yet what Jesus has done for us on the cross to forgive us for our sins is stoning out the ground. Well, that's a great start. And then he digs it over. Well, he's digging it over. He digs it over. It's fertile, but he digs it over. And digging it over brings all that fertility to the surface, doesn't it? I was thinking about this in the week, and I'm thinking, if you think about the Old Testament, which is all the goodness of God, it really, it's not always brought to the surface. Jesus brings it to the surface. Doesn't matter if you've got fertile soil just down there. It needs to be brought to the surface and aerated. And Jesus, in bringing the scriptures to the surface in himself, brings all that goodness. We've got the parable of the sower. If, we, you, know, if, you, if you put our roots down into good soil, you will grow. We need to be growing in good soil. And there is no problem with good soil. 
Sometimes you see one of these lorries driving around with a big lorry load of soil, you know. You do not have problems with soil. God has given us what we need to grow. And in terms of that, you might just think of the word of God. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the New Testament's digging it. It's a good, not a bad picture, actually. The New Testament is digging over the Old Testament. <laughs> it's bringing all those depths of riches uh, to the surface that you can see them in Jesus. And it's no good us saying, oh, we haven't got any soil. We got lots of soil. This is the word of life. This is what you can grow out of, you know. How many of you are trying to grow on a concrete path when we're growing it? Be rooted in the word. He's put it there for us. And then he talks about rain. I, I was talking about rain. I was talking about the Holy Spirit, really. Think about the Holy Spirit. There is no problem with the sun in the Middle East. We don't pray for sun. We pray for rain. And uh, he, he gives us, he, he's got this rain raining on his vineyard. Because at the end he said he decides not to let it rain. So it rains on the vineyard. We are watered by the Spirit. In the Old Testament, or at least pre-Pentecost, you can see the Spirit falling on the great and the good, like Moses and uh, Abraham and this sort of thing, like series of thunderstorms in various areas. Since Pentecost, it's rained all over the place. You can receive the Spirit, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you are open to him. He waters us. Some years you will say, oh, my carrots haven't done well. It hasn't rained enough. We do not ever need to say that about Jesus. He, the, the Spirit is with us. It's not having a dry day. We may not be open to him. We may have our umbrellas up, as we've said somewhere else. But the water is always there. You see that? So with the digging and the watering, we have the Word of God. We have the Spirit. And all that is invested for us. Jesus died for us before we knew his name. The Spirit came after Pentecost, before we were open to the Spirit. The Word was written before we read it. It's all investment. What a great thing that is. And all the resources that you need for fruitfulness are there. Are they? All, the fru all the resources for fruitfulness are there. And then he goes on. He builds a wall around it. Now, he said, what are you going to build a wall around it? Because in that area, the kind of things that you get, sort of the, the, the goats and the semi, um, semi sort of wild um, sheep, they forage. They will push their way in anywhere. They will push in and they will eat anything. You see goats eating thorns. I don't know how they do it. But they will eat everything. They will go through there. They are a primeval dyson. They will just go through. And the whole lot will go. It will just go. There ain't anything else to eat. So you need a wall around it to give them security so they don't get eaten. And you know, Jesus, Jesus says, doesn't he, elsewhere talking about the sheepfold, I am the gate. Obviously you've got to get into it and they would have got some thorns they brought across as a gate. And he says, I am the gate. That's a good picture. So that Jesus gives us security to be fruitful. And in a way, I, I often feel that the wall is him. He puts himself between me and the threat. He puts himself between you and what is threatening you at this time. It's a good picture. I might have told you before that you know, one or two times in my life when I felt threatened in some way and I've been out running, I've had a feeling that a personage, whether it's the Lord or it's an angel, has been running next to me, pacing me. And he's, he's on the... <laughs> It feels as though he's on the shoulder, the left or the right shoulder, that puts him between me and the problem. I will run with you and I will run between you and the problem. You know? I don't know if that's very strong. And this morning, if you feel you can't be fruitful uh, because you are under pressure, under threat, under threat, the Lord says, I protect you to give you the space to be fruitful. If you're worried about everything, it's difficult to be fruitful, isn't it? If you're worried about other people, it's difficult to be fruitful. If you're worried about your finances and yourself and your health and your wealth and all those things, it's difficult to be careful for other people when you are so un feel under threat. Uh, you go to those sort of, if you go to sort of mid-North Wales, you see all those great Norman castles. And many of them, you know, like um, Harlech and, and that, 
are, are on, on the coast and they're right amazing beaches next to them but I reckon that those great Normans you know back in the 11th century those Normans they they did not spend their time on the beach in a deck chair because they were very insecure so they built themselves a massive great castle you know like you get a Conway or something like this and they all went inside they didn't say hey what a great swimming beach no no they were in there because they wanted to be secure and the Lord gives us that security today you didn't build the wall he builds the wall he stands between us and often at our church we feel you know you go to a church meeting and it's all about threats and problems and issues and challenges and you feel you're not loose enough at all to be fruitful you're so busy as I said before we're more like cactus than anything else you know it's a defense mechanism you know? he built a wall around it. I want you to think that this morning that he gives you the security in your life to be fruitful that doesn't mean there are no goats out there but it does mean he stands between you and them and stands between us and them he builds a wall and he is that way. I'm there between you you try, you try that in your mind you try feeling him standing between you and the problem ok it's got the wall so what else did he build then Tower, absolutely, that's good. I'm going to ask you what else he built in a moment, so you can be thinking about that, all right? But it was only five minutes ago. I know it sounds longer, it feels longer, but... Um, and I know it'll tell you on your tablet, Pete, but... Yeah. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> built a major investment to build a tower in those days. He builds a tower so he can look down on the whole vineyard. What a great picture. What a great picture of an overview. You know, towers do give you an overview, don't they? Those people who used to, you know, any, any elevation gives you an overview. You know, that, that, that sort of chap at Wimbledon, he has a high seat so he can see everything, you know. So when you're down at ground level, you can't see whether it was in or out, but he can look down and he can see that sort of thing. Or those people who used to get in the middle of mazes on the top of a tower would show you the way out when you panicked entirely. In modern terms, now we've got satellites looking down and, and they tell you where they are you are apparently so that that kind of thing uh, from above it gives you an overview what a great thing that in your life whenever you pray the lord has an overview he doesn't say oh, i can't see from here what your problem is he has an overview but more than that he has an interest i like to think that um that, that the Lord would have gone out to sit in his tower at dusk and have a look at his vineyard. <laughs> that the Lord loves you, is interested in how it's going. A vineyard at dusk is probably the best time to be. I have slept in a vineyard at dusk between the, between, on the ground between the vines. It is the best day, part of the day for a vineyard. Can you imagine? The Lord, it tells us in the Bible the Lord rejoices in you when you are not rejoicing in yourself. He's got an eye on us. He said, how's it going? I've got you here, my eye. I built a tower. I've invested my time and my resources to keep an eye on you. What a great thing that is. And the final thing he built then? A wine press. A wine press. Okay. That's a, almost an even bigger investment because you need a hole, but you need big stones and all sorts of things to produce uh, wine from these grapes that have not yet grown. I think this is a great picture of God believing in us and investing in the future. He builds it when there's no grapes at all. It's no good having a harvest and suddenly say, oh, I think we better build a wine press. It's not going to work, is it? It's just like one of our, our, our dairy farmers saying, oh, we've got lots of milk. Where's the tanker? Go and build one. You, you couldn't do that. You invest in the future. And, and I, I found this particularly strong, that the Lord believes in me, and he believes in you. He believes in what's going to happen. He believes in your fruitfulness. In fact, he believes in it so much that he invests in it before it happens. So, for instance, um, say he's seeking you to be fruitful in a relationship which hasn't gone well. So, 
you're there being able to heal that relationship and have good conversation with person somebody you haven't had for a long time that but then the question is when you haven't spoken for some time now things are better what are we going to say and so that relationship is not just to be healed but to develop into something else but the lord will have that in mind the lord will have that in mind so where do i go from here i've already got that oh i haven't thought of that the lord never says oh i never thought of that he thought of it before you know so you've been trusting the lord for some resources in time or money or, or something and it, and it happens and then you say oh thank you lord what am i going to do with it he said i already have a plan we pray for some new people to come to the church and they come and they weren't exactly the people we were hoping for and we say what are we going to do lord with these people he said i've already got a plan because you're fruitful and I've invested in your future. I'm working on the fact that the person will say yes. I'm working on the fact that that will happen. I'm working on the fact that there will be fruit. I'm already there. Yeah. I know that you're going to bring a new person and I'm ready to talk to them. So good. And then he leaves it. All that investment. No, no. As he says, I've done everything I can. And so he's looking for the fruit. That's what he is like today. Encouraging, warm, smiling. <laughs> like, I put all this in. I believe in you. So then. That is so different from what have you done. That is where the parable sits, you see. And what do they produce? Well, the old Israel produced sour grapes. It doesn't produce nothing. You know when St. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is this, this, and this? Before that, he says the fruit of the opposition is this, this, and this, and it's all horrible stuff. You're going to produce something. He'd done all this for them. He'd loved them and protected them, and that had given them the ability to be fruitful, but in the wrong way. They felt secure. They felt smug. They felt um, that they were sort of privileged. And what did it do? They, they, they didn't produce what they were supposed to be producing. They were producing bad things, bad relationships, dishonesty, not caring for the poor, not worshipping the Lord. They produced a lot of stuff. They didn't produce nothing. You're going to live something in your life, aren't you? It's not, you know, well, I don't do anything at all. And if you don't do, if you aren't fruitful in one way, you'll be fruitful in another way. And I think, I think from our point of view, we are not going to say, I've never been fruitful. There are things that you are fruitful with. You think there are things with us as a church we are fruitful with. But the power of this parable is that I feel that what we are producing is disproportionately small in relation to the investment that the Lord has put into us. If I'm serious about thinking about how much he's loved me, how much he's died for me, the spirit, the word, the protection, the guidance, the interest, what I have produced is a disgrace. And the more I look at the Lord's investment, the more I feel that. If I don't look at the investment, I think, well, it's better than nothing, isn't it? And the strength of that love and encouragement makes me feel I should be doing better. And we finish with just two things, two things that are very different on that. On the one hand, there is the, there's the judgment. How does God feel about this? He, he says, could I have done any more? Judge me between me and the vineyard. And so that he is angry. And there is, there is judgment here. And he sweeps through it. The war goes, the briars come in, the goats come in, the rain stops, it's trashed. That is the judgment that comes from not being fruitful. God is not amused. And the message for us is that that's where the judgment is. That's how God feels. This is not a hobby. Being a Christian is not like having an allotment or a garden and it's a nice thing to do and all that sort of thing. It's a serious business. You think this is overkill. <laughs> this is how it is without the cross. This is, how it, this is how it is that we have all this invested in us and we have underperformed. And it's, it's not his fault, it's our fault. And he said, enough is enough. We need to hold that. Nothing is changed about that in the New Testament. That is the judgment before the cross. Otherwise, we're kind of casual and say, oh, no, not at all. But with the cross, Jesus comes in, as in that parable in the New Testament, 
and says, um, before you cut it down, sir, I will dig around it once more. It's very privileged. How often do you plant an olive tree in a vineyard? You don't. You put it out on the hillside. This is a privileged tree. And, a, and the master says, I've had enough. It's, it looks nice, but it doesn't produce any figs, you know? Or olives, or olives. olives. Anyway, it doesn't produce any fruit. Cut it down. And he says, well, I'll dig around it again. This is the chance, the opportunity that Jesus gives us from the cross. And it is a finite opportunity. And the judgment remains. I'm looking for fruit here. And the Lord is forgiving us, cleansing us, digging over a bit more, bit more fertilizer, bit more rain. And will we be doing now? There is in, in that, part, that part of Luke um, no grounds for complacency. The parables around that, the teaching around that are now is the time. Now or not. Make or break. So uh, this morning then, we come to communion, which is the fruit of the lamb, isn't it? The bread and the wine, as it would have been for them. We say, Lord, we just want to forgive us for not being very fruitful um, in relation to what you've done for us. Just think what he's done for you. And everything that you've done for him pales into insignificance. It's significant, but it's, it's not good. So we're so sorry, Lord. I'm not really taking it serious. I'm taking it as a hobby, you know? And sense the judgment, but also sense the chance that he gives us. The grace that he gives us through his death on the cross. I'll dig it round. He's digging round you now. And the fathers say, oh, let's see what we're going to get this year. Let's have a look. Let's see what we can do. I'll give you a hand. We'll do some digging. Let's get some more watering. Get some more compost. Get some more manure. We'll see what we can do. So what will we do?